Greetings and good morning. Welcome to worship. Here the people of First Baptist Church, wherever we are, invite you to come together to worship the living God on this highest and holiest of days, on Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Day. And first and foremost, let us proclaim the good news of the day. Join me now in the traditional Easter acclamation. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. 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 And sister says Christ is risen indeed. On this day, you won victory over death by raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O God, our Father and Creator. For us and for our salvation, you overcame death, defeated all evil, and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amidst all times and circumstances, you lead us into the truth. You convict us of righteousness, you comfort us with your peace that surpasses all understanding. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit, our sustainer and advocate. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Glory, Glory to you, you, O blessed triune God, God, always and forever and ever. And ever. Let us pray. Father, we're here on this most anticipated Sunday of the year to celebrate the love you gave us and continue to give us through your Son, who died for us while we were yet sinners. Help us to thirst for you as Jesus thirsted on the cross. And may we be Easter people. As the hymn declares, every day to us is Easter with its resurrection song. Even when life overwhelms us, Easter people sing this song, Alleluia, Alleluia everlasting Sunday song. Amen.
Our scripture for today is Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. I'm so glad to see you this Easter morning. Our scripture today reminds us that Jesus has risen. He is risen indeed, and it reminds us to not be afraid. So let's listen to our scripture story for today. So today, with it being Easter Sunday, is where our story picks up. On Good Friday, Jesus was hung on the cross to die. And then on Saturday, they had taken his body and they had wrapped him in white cloth and they had placed him in the tomb and they had moved a huge stone in front of the grave, in front of the tomb, and he was there to stay. And now it is Sunday, the start of a new week, and Mary of Magdalene and Mary are on their way to visit Jesus' tomb. Right before they got there, there was a large earthquake. The earth shook. The angel came down and he moved the stone away. And he sat upon that top of that stone. And the guards that were standing around them were in amazement. They were actually scared and they fell down. They kind of fainted. Well, Mary, when the Marys got there, when both of the ladies got there, they were amazed. They were kind of afraid because here was the tomb and when they last left it, the stone had been rolled in front of it. Now it was open. Who could have done such a thing? And number two, they saw an angel sitting on top of it. And the angel said, hello. And then he said, do not be afraid. I know who you are here for. I know that you are here to see Jesus. Well, take a look. He said, look in the, in the tomb. You will see he's not here. He has risen. He has risen just like he said he would. But here's what I need for you to do, ladies, the angel said. Here's what I need you to do. I need for you to go and tell Jesus' disciples what has happened. Go tell them that they are to meet him in Galilee. And so they did. The Marys left. They were excited. They were overwhelmed. They were filled with all sorts of emotions. And they ran to go tell the disciples what they were supposed to tell them. And when they did, they met a couple. And they began to tell them that Jesus, is, that Jesus had risen, the tomb the, was empty, the stone had been rolled away, and you need to go to Galilee because that's what Jesus wants you to do. And then all of a sudden, amongst that little group of people, there Jesus came. He came to them and he said, greetings, hello. 
And then he said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. They began to go down to his feet and they worshipped him. And then he told them, Go and tell my other brothers. Go and tell them, go and tell them to meet me at Galilee. And there I will see them again. So today we celebrate the fact that Jesus has risen. He has risen indeed. And we celebrate the fact that because Jesus is risen, we do not have to be afraid. He is with us always. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, at Easter we celebrate resurrection and new life. We celebrate warmer days, we blooming flowers, butterflies leaving their chrysalis, living things and growing things all around us. Help us to look for them and see them. Help us to look for your son, Jesus, all around us as well. Your mighty hands that are holding us close to you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that we ask. Amen. As we remember each other in prayer during this time, I would ask this week that you continue to remember Beth Garrett, who is at Duke University Medical Center. Remember Thelma Trent, Susan Weber's aunt. And remember Scott's uncle, James Broyhill, who at the time of this recording was at Grace Hospital awaiting surgery. Now let us pray together this morning. God of Easter, as we come to you in prayer this day, we come with a bit of disappointment. Disappointment that we are not gathered in church. Disappointment that we are still wrapped up in a pandemic. Disappointment that Easter wasn't what we expected it to be. We do love the sights of Easter. We love to see the flowers on the cross, the pews packed, the colorful outfits, the joy of children and adults alike. We love to see the signs of life and resurrection. Yet on this Easter, perhaps God, you are teaching us to live by faith and not by sight. Remind us again, as you reminded Thomas, that blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Surely we know that the first Easter was not what anyone expected either. In this time of great uncertainty, our lives are sustained by the fact that your victory is not under review. Easter's resurrection is not under question. On this day, death is still defeated. On this day, God, the grave is still conquered. On this day, salvation has come and an unhealable wound is healed. It may not look like we expected it, Lord, but maybe this is the Easter we need this year. God, I ask that you remind us of this Easter when we wonder about whether or not you are an active God and part of our world. Because today the tomb is empty. You have things to do. Victory has been declared. You, God, have won. Lord, make that as true in our homes and living rooms, in our communities and nations, in our hearts and our souls, as it has ever been. God of Easter, we declare our faith, and though we may not see, we believe. Amen.
As I began to ponder this week's Easter sermon, I found myself surrounded by the news of the day. Cable news playing on the DIN TV, notifications chiming on my smartphone, news websites up on my desktop computer. The 20th century Swiss theologian Karl Barth would, would say that's well and good for a preacher preparing to preach. He often urged his ministry students to prepare their sermons with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. At this point in time, the news of the day is a constant anxiety-ridden stream of information and commentary about our current global health crisis. The coronavirus and adaptation of the common cold has seized our attention like nothing in recent memory. But it has also seized our freedom and productivity and for some, their health. This new virus and our efforts to resist disrupts our normal pattern of living, our relationships, our work, our economics, our travel, our emotional state, and yes, for some, unfortunately, life itself. With a virulent new virus comes the possibility of death. Whatever the channel or headline or post, the news of the day not only speaks words, but also numbers. The cable news channels quantify the pandemic with sensationally large graphics of constantly changing totals. How many people have contracted COVID-19? How many are recovering? How many have died? The news coverage is somewhat like on election night, but here these are not, not votes, these are lives. Every hour, the new numbers come in, the, the total from New York, from L.A., from Washington State. But now they're talking about North Carolina, about Raleigh, about Charlotte, about McDowell County. Did you hear? Three more cases. Community spread, they're calling it. In response, we're fighting the battle with hand sanitizer, Lysol, and face masks. Some people must work. Medical professionals care for those infected. Police officers and EMS respond to calls. Factory workers turn out needed goods. Retail clerks work overtime to fill our cupboards and our grocery carts. But most of us are at home, sheltering in place, trying to steer clear of the bug and anyone who might have it. And yes, we're scared. Many are thoroughly frightened. We don't want to be one of the numbers on the morning news. Our Bible reading for today starts in a similar place. In the dim light of dawn, there are two women who are facing death and despair. Two days after Jesus was crucified, Mary Magdalene and, and the other Mary have come to the tomb. Matthew gives no particular explanation as to why, but why does anyone go to a grave? We go to graves with memories, flowers, and tears. We go to say that we love you, that we miss you, that we wish we were still with you. We go to say that, that we haven't forgotten you. We go to the grave to remember and to mourn. After all, that's, that's all we have when death has come. We no longer have the person. We have what remains of the person, a marker at a geographical location, a place of remembrance. We go to the grave because there's nothing else to go to. Death has snatched our loved one away. The tomb marks that reality. Dead people don't come back. So in no way did these women come to the tomb with any expectations. They certainly didn't visit the grave anticipating Jesus would rise from it. The women were not looking for a miracle, just the opposite. They were facing the cold, hard facts. Jesus was gone and Jesus wasn't coming back. To this, they were witnesses. They saw him anguish and pain. They saw him take his last breath. 
they saw his pale, lifeless corpse carried away, placed in the tomb and the great stone door slammed shut. They knew that dead people don't come back. A clear indication of the women's lack of expectation is in the sole subject of conversation as they approached the tomb. As other gospel accounts record, the women were wondering, who's going to roll away the stone? If these women didn't expect God to move the stone, they certainly didn't expect God to raise Jesus from the dead. They didn't expect it because they knew better. They knew that dead people don't come back. Matthew tells how Joseph of Arimathea placed Jesus in the tomb and how by Pilate's decree, soldiers were posted at the entrance. The tomb was watched and guarded, but then at dawn on the third day on Sunday, the women arrived at the tomb. And as they approached, Matthew says, There was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. Why did the angel move the stone? Did he move it to let Jesus out? No, he moved it to let the women see inside. The angel removed the stone to reveal that the tomb was empty. No body inside, no Jesus inside. The angel said, he is not here for he has been raised. Come and see the place where where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples. Now I know there are skeptics. I know that the four Gospels tell this this news in very different ways. Some of the details are the same, but some of the details are not the same. People have tried to harmonize the four Gospels, but that never seems to come out so neat and tidy. And also, if the Romans were involved, Where is their record? Where are are the Roman histories? A guy in Palestine was was raised from the dead. You would think somebody in, in Rome would have written that down. But no, but no, there are no records. And then there's science and medicine, biology, and just plain common sense. All the evidence tells us that, that death is the end of the road. No more chapters in the story. We know that dead people don't come back. Or perhaps this was some kind of psychological soothing among the disciples. The disciples were distraught with grief, their hearts broken, their hopes crushed. They wanted to keep Jesus alive. All the wise teaching, all the powerful memories, all the good times, it's as though he's still with us. They collectively determined to keep Jesus alive. But none of that adds up. This band of disciples had once enjoyed the excitement and energy of a growing, surging movement. They stood alongside a religious rock star. They cheered him on as he arrived in the capital city. They threw him a grand parade. They rolled out the red carpet. They proclaimed Jesus King and Savior, Messiah. The disciples had such grand, wonderful aspirations for Jesus. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But then, by Friday, it all came crashing down. All destroyed, all gone, crucified and buried nailed to a cross, dead. And they knew the dead don't come back. No hope, only sadness, only defeat, only fear. But on that first Easter Sunday, 
something changed. The disciples changed. No, not merely changed, transformed. They were transformed from fear to excitement, from despair to joy. Something gave the two Marys confidence to run and tell. Something gave Peter boldness to preach. Something gave Thomas faith to believe. Something gave Cloopas and, and the other disciples sight to see. Something gave Paul the passion to proclaim the gospel from Judea to Rome and beyond. Something changed. There was an effect to this news. The disciples changed. And it all began, according to Matthew, with an earthquake. Ground shaking, mountains heaving, guards trembling like dead men. The great stone door rolled away to reveal an empty tomb. And the angel declared, he is not here, he has been raised. As theologian Karl Barth put it to his ministry students, the job of a preacher is to take the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Interestingly enough, though that Barth quote is often quoted, no one can find a bona fide record of him actually saying it. Not exactly like that. What he did say is found in a 1963 Time Magazine interview talking about his oft given advice to young theologians, Karl Barth said this. He said, take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. Alongside the dreadful news of our day, coronavirus and all, here is the news of all days. Jesus Christ has, has been raised from the dead. Yes, I said, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. We don't have a first-hand account of this occurrence. Nobody was actually there when Jesus was raised up. We don't know how it happened. We don't know exactly when it happened. Furthermore, everything we know about life and death, science and reason, tells us that it could not have happened. And yet, everything points to the fact that something did happen. Something big, something dramatic, something that changed the path of so many lives across so many centuries. Those first disciples, women and men, heard the news and they believed the news. In fact, they devoted their lives to the news. Or more precisely, they devoted their lives to the person at the center of the good news, the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. What appeared to be the end of the story was, was not the end of the story. As my former seminary professor Donald Jewell once wrote, none of the Gospels can really end the story of Jesus. The whole point is that it continues and that its significance continues. Christ's resurrection means that the story of Jesus is to be continued in you, in me, and in every life that is touched by the power of the good news that Christ is risen. Like the earthquake that, that first announced the resurrection, so does this news shake up our world and shake up our lives. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, God can do anything. God took the cruel cross and made it his sign of victory. God took the worst that humanity could do, all our death and despair and destruction. God took all sickness, war, famine, and hate, God took all the sin and evil in the world upon the cross and God defeated it once and for all. God triumphed over it. God even killed death itself. We know that the dead don't come back, but Jesus came back. Jesus did it and that changes everything. 
And most of all, that changes us. In the resurrection news, the gospel story continues. The story of Jesus continues in you and in me and in all those whom he enlists. As soon as Jesus began his ministry back in Galilee, he gathered disciples. He called forth helpers in his ministry. And likewise, as soon as Jesus rose from the dead, he enlisted help. He first spoke these words, do not be afraid, go and tell. Yes, Jesus came back. He came back to us and for us. He came back to, to call us into his ministry. It's like New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says in his, his book, Surprised by Hope. Jesus is raised, so God's new creation is begun. And we, his followers, have a job to do. So that's your calling. That's your purpose. That's your ongoing Easter mission. God has appointed you to be his ambassadors, to be his personal messengers, to go and tell good news to a world full of bad news. To say, do not be afraid, Christ is risen, that changes everything. Yes, that changes everything. Amen. No!
And now as we close our service together, let us bow our heads and join in prayer. Jesus, our risen Lord, your Easter people gather with joy to celebrate your great victory this day. Where we are intimidated by the forces of evil, the dominance of death, and the heartache and sorrow across the globe and around our country, you are not. You went head to toe with the powers and principalities and triumph. Therefore, despite the news of today, we shout for joy, we lift up and sing hallelujahs. In this time of Easter, move us beyond praising you with our songs and music to praise you with our lives and witness. Having gathered us by your resurrection, now send us forth to do your resurrection work in the world. Where there is timidity, let us bring forth your courage. Where there is sadness, let us bring forth your joy. Where there is loneliness and despair, let us bring forth your love. Where there is anxiety and fear, let us bring forth your peace. Give us what we need to be faithful, vibrant agents of Easter, bearers and witnesses of your good news, that you are risen and ruling. Go with us now and always, Lord Jesus. We make this prayer in your holy name. You who reign supreme in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.